So how did they successfully exploit this vulnerability? Well, they used a hardware attack, of course, to change out the spy flash contents. And because this is, again, a software implementation flaw uh, class, uh, you know, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. But as always, the only reason we walk through exploits is to make sure that people understand the feasibility and realism of these sort of attacks. So the first order setup of this rather complicated thing from uh, Peter was basically an overly complicated way to reroute his spy flash chip. So that's the spy flash on the laptop motherboard. Reroute it out to a different physical spy flash chip uh, and basically have the attack control data on that other chip and then have the, the circuitry and the logic basically figure out when it should reroute to the different spy flash. That has the simplicity option and that you don't have to sort of re-implement all of the uh, logic about how SpyFlash should be handled. You just use an off-the-shelf chip that already has all that logic hardwired into it. It's just a matter of uh, filling in the attacker-controlled contents that you want to have when you want to flip out uh, the other chip, basically replace the original chip reads with the second chip reads. But of course, you can see it's very prototypey and it's uh, very cumbersome of uh, setting up all the wiring and everything. Now, a better version of that that was also used for the initial BiosGuard uh, proof of concept attack utilizes an FPGA, that is, which is a field programmable gate array uh, chip that has basically reconfigurable logic. That reconfigurable logic can be taught how to speak spy, and then you clip on with one of these chip clips and then essentially it can say, okay, I, I'm speaking spy, I'm seeing these transactions come across the wire. Now, once I see this particular double fetch right here, I'm going to feed back the attacker controlled data instead of the original data. And that worked to some degree, but they noted that this was uh, only one megabit of RAM to hold on to the contents, and that was somewhat limiting. But the basic idea of connecting this FPGA as a machine in the middle attacker is that the, this is how the, um, the wiring works for spy flash chips. And so the FPGA is wired up and connected to the clock and connected to the serial out and connected to the serial in of uh, these lines. And then for the spy flash chip, this would be just the thing that's on the laptop. The PCH is the platform controller hub. That's an Intel chip, or it could be built into the Intel system on a chip. That's the thing that talks to the spy flash chip and reads in the firmware in the BIOS and the UEFI at boot time. So the attacker is the FPGA in this context, and they want to basically make it so that when the Intel is trying to fetch from the spy flash chip, instead it is fetching malicious content as necessary from the FPGA. So they noted that uh, some laptop designs had a nice thing that made this nice and easy. So the spy flash not CS and not chip select. This is a uh, pin that is active when it's low. So when it's low, then the chip is selected. When it's high, the chip is not selected. This, if it is wired into a resistor on the motherboard, means that the wiring diagram looks like this. You get a resistor there. And that means the FPGA can now force the voltage high. And that means that now this chip select, this chip will say, oh, well, when the, the voltage is high, then I should just turn off and not answer things. So this will turn itself off. This will continue answering read requests from the Intel CPU. So again, I know this is not a hardware class. And we do actually have a uh, hardware class that covers exactly this sort of attack uh, elsewhere on OSD2. And I'll link to that on the website. So... SpySpy 1 was updated to SpySpy 2 by moving to an FPGA with more memory, and this gave more capacity to uh, swap out, uh, just basically to take an entire flash chip worth of firmware, dump it onto the thing as is with the little, you know, change that the, the attacker wants to make maliciously, and then it's a lot more flexible. And I just point out that, you know, they had some problems with this, making an FPGA do the right things. There were uh, problems of the the timing on the FPGA not exactly matching the timing that they needed for spy flash transactions. So issues were encountered and issues were solved. And that's just to say at the end of the day, they have spy spy v2. It's open source hardware. It's open source software. And you can just go and buy the hardware, download the software. And now you have a attacker platform that is capable of doing machine in the middle attacks against spy flash. And I want to be clear again that this is not only an Intel problem, this is not only a UEFI problem, this spy spy hardware can be used for doing these sort of attacks on anything that uses spy flash. So all sorts of embedded systems and 
you know, AMD systems as well as Intel systems and Google Chromebooks using Core Boot as well as UEFI systems. So this is a sort of generic uh, hardware attack mechanism. So the real takeaway here is that if you're a developer and you're working on firmware, you should recognize that this sort of hardware attack is absolutely possible right now. And therefore, you know, you should take to heart this idea of not double fetching from the spy flash because if you fetch a second time, it could be acid the second time. And if you're a vulnerability hunter, you should know that this is now something that's potentially in your toolkit. And you can use this not just against Intel systems, but all the other embedded systems and everything else using SpyFlash out there.